Ever wonder how the church or religious communities can work together with the government for the common good? Our guest, Melissa Rogers, will be talking about just that on Good God. Welcome to Good God. I'm George Mason. Conversations about faith in public life. And our guest today is Melissa Rogers, a longtime friend and colleague who is a former director of the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships for uh, the Obama administration, uh, but also has been at work for years in uh, legal work with the Baptist Joint Committee and in teaching and especially on issues of religious liberty uh, in American life. And thank you so much, Melissa, for being with us and for being willing to talk with us. Sure, thank you, George. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So you're uh, most recent celebrated position was uh, one that uh, I think uh, maybe people first started hearing about during George W. Bush's administration, That's and right. that is uh, this idea that uh, the government should not be hostile to faith groups that are doing work in the public square uh, that is of interest to the state as well, to the common good. Right. And so, for example, I guess one might say a drug or alcohol rehabilitation center that is faith-based shouldn't um, be discriminated against and not receive funds from the federal government because it has a faith-based orientation. Uh, and, and so, but once, uh, once you begin to go down that road, it gets more complicated, doesn't it? That's so, right. So what are some of the things that would be, I mentioned drug and alcohol rehabilitation, but there, there have to be other things that uh, people would like to know where that uh, intersection is between the government and its funding and, uh, and the church or uh, religious communities that are working in, in, in public life. Right. So you're, you're exactly right that this office was established by President George W. Bush. And he had a particular approach to these issues that kind of came out of his experience and interest. Mm -hmm. And then when President Obama came into the White House, actually when he was on the campaign trail, he made a speech saying that if he were elected, he would keep the office while putting his own stamp on its okay. activities, policies, and right. practices. Right. And you know, he has a background as a community organizer right. working with re religious groups and other groups in the South Side of Chicago. So this was an area that was very familiar to him. Mm -hmm. And those who knew him weren't surprised that, you know, even though presidents, new subsequent presidents don't always keep signature initiatives of their predecessor, particularly mm -hmm. if they're a president of another party, yes. he, people who knew President Obama were not surprised that he decided to keep it while changing it in, in ways that he thought made sense for his priorities and, his, right. and the work that he thought the American people wanted to do, both at home and abroad, to help people in need. Right. So, you know, one of the things that the president wanted us to do, or I'll mention two at the top, is uh, first he wanted us to expand this idea of partnerships, mm -hmm. to go beyond financial partnerships. Uh. Most religious groups do not want government money, right. they, but they do have shared some shared aims with government. Right. They want to feed hungry children in right. the summer who are not getting that mm -hmm. free or subsidized meal mm -hmm. at their school. They want to make right. sure they still get that meal in the summer. Right. So how could they come alongside a group that might be government funded and make sure that they provide activities for children yes. that are receiving the meal or transport children to the location mm -hmm. where the meal is served? Um, they want to do jobs clubs in their churches that, mm -hmm. you know, the government doesn't give any grants or contracts for that. But what we can do is have this tremendous convening power yeah. where we can bring, um, we know about jobs clubs that are working at ha congregations very effectively in California and also in New York mm -hmm. and also in Kansas mm -hmm. and Louisiana. We can put everybody on the phone together easily yeah. and have them share best practices about how to help underemployed or unemployed people have the support they need to you know, do well and have an abundant life. So the first thing he wanted to uh, stress with us was let's work on non-financial partnerships as well as financial partnerships okay. because they're equally important. And indeed, most religious and community groups that want to work with government want to work in that fashion. Okay. Um, secondarily, he wanted us to take a look at some of the rules that were put in place by the Bush administration 
some of which were controversial. He knew that, and um, what he asked us to do through an advisory council on faith-based and neighborhood partnerships that was quite intentionally diverse, including having some people who you know were associated with the Bush office, he said, try to find common ground. Let's mm -hmm. see if we can find places where we agree, mm -hmm. and let's make those reforms. Okay. So for example, one of the things that we did agree on, while we disagreed on many things, we agreed that we should do more to protect the religious liberty of social service beneficiaries. Okay. So when beneficiaries of social service are going to a religious organization that's in a financial relationship with government, um, they should always know that they should never be discriminated against because of their religion or lack thereof, right. that they do not have to participate in privately funded religious activities mm -hmm. in order to receive direct funded government activities, mm -hmm. and these sorts right. of things. Right. So those were the two things that right out of the blocks Right. we started to work on and then there were many others but I just mentioned that sort so of if you go to a soup kitchen and mm -hmm. uh, they they want to offer you food because you're hungry or homeless and you have to hear a sermon first to participate in that uh, that sort of crosses the line and if right. there's government funding for it then that becomes a kind of discriminatory coercion. practice yeah. a coercive practice yeah. good so you know yeah. first of all the, these the rules already said that any beneficiary who is getting, and I'm sorry to use technical language here, but it, a grant funded, you know, or a contract funded service from the government through a religious organization, um, they should never have to, you know, participate in religious activities that are privately funded and separated from those grant funded activities if they don't want to. And they should never have the sense that they, um, you know, they won't receive their government benefits unless they participate right. in the religious activities. Right. So that was on the books. The problem was beneficiaries didn't necessarily know that. Yes. Right. And religious organizations, in my experience, were happy to tell them that, but they didn't always think about telling them that either. So what we, one of the reforms that we put in place was to say, you gotta give the beneficiaries a written notice when yes. they come to your organization. And it spells out in you know, just about five or six bullets what can and can't be done. Mm -hmm. And then it tells the beneficiaries if there's a violation of these rules, here's a number for you to call right. at government. Um, right. and, and the religious organizations we found were very happy to do this because they said, you know, this is a marvelous teaching tool for us, right. for our staff to say, everybody read this notice, mm -hmm. make sure that you know these rules, right. make sure that you're handing it out and able to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a really positive project that we were able to work on together with people who had, you know, varying views on other um, church state issues. Well, speaking of church state issues, <clears throat> you and I, um, share a, a history of yeah. probably interpreting uh, religious liberty more uh, in a strict separationist uh, way than the so-called accommodationist mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. of uh, reading the First Amendment. And, and to simplify that, I guess we would say that we, we, we have traditionally tried to maintain that wall of separation between mm -hmm. church and state, whereas those who are more accommodationist have said that the uh, the the government certainly should not control the church, but the church should have a considerable influence over the government, and it, 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 it's more that direction, I suppose you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you got into this, surely you had those kinds of uh, apprehensions that you were uh, participating in what seemed like the kind of approach to religious liberty that actually you'd argued against in some ways, mm -hmm. right? So right. how did you wrestle with that and come to a piece about uh, where to work in this productively? Right. Well, you know, the, the you're right that there were some tensions around certain issues, particularly some of the roles that President Bush put in place that I didn't agree with. Um, and so you know, one of the things that you have to realize when you come into government is that, you know, there's there are things that you have to implement that you don't necessarily agree with right. all the time right. um, because they're the law. And right. so yeah. uh, you have to, you know, do that. And um, so that was, that was part of the way I dealt with some of it. And then other parts of it, um, you know, we would, we, we did 
and were able to change somewhat, um, like the kinds of things that I'm describing, that I thought helped to rebalance somewhat okay. uh, the equation. So yeah, it's an interesting process. And of course, I'm working for the president and implementing his vision. Um, and so, you know, it was a really, and the president is very, by the way, conversant with our Baptist tradition. In fact, I remember going to uh, uh, the first speech I ever heard him give, um, and the president quoted John Leland, uh, oh, pastor, Baptist pastor John Leland. Right. And I thought, you know, I don't think I've ever heard a U.S. senator uh, quote John Leland. Right. Well, <laughs> so, for those who are listening or watching and don't know who John Leland was, he was the Baptist evangelist and pastor in Virginia who was the perhaps most influential uh, figure in putting pressure on James Madison right. to get us finally the Bill of Rights, but specifically the First Amendment, religious liberty. Right, right. And, yeah. and the president very much understood uh, and understands the important role of the Establishment Clause. He would just yes. out, go out of his way, um, and you can see this in several, for example, um, his remarks at the National Prayer Breakfast, to say mm -hmm. that it is wrong to think about that uh, the First Amendment's free speech and free exercise clauses are the real religious liberty protections. Yes. And the Establishment Clause is something that's maybe not as friendly to religion. The President was very good about explaining a, a view that we share that is, um, you know, the Establishment Clause also plays a very important role in protecting religion. Right. And um, so he would talk about the, the way in which it ensures that religion is a voluntary uh, experience for Americans and that that is what gives it its vitality. Um, so, you know, it was uh, definitely fun to talk to him about these things that he, uh, he and I shared. Well, really, the, the First Amendment has been an extremely helpful thing, as you say, to the vitality of American religion. Exactly. And yet, it continues to be a contentious matter for people who are religious, uh, right. which is actually quite extraordinary when you think of it. Uh, it sometimes I, I feel like we're killing the goose that laid the golden egg here because uh, when you look back on the history of our country, every religion has been able to thrive better uh, by virtue of the protections of the First Amendment, and yet we seem to have something in us that wants to be more privileged uh, somehow, whether, uh, whether it's to privilege our particular religious uh, tradition, right. uh, or it's to privilege our right to actually hold convictions that feel discriminatory toward mm -hmm. others, too. Yeah. yeah, and there's, as you described, there's a range of tensions here. I think the easiest one to confront is the people who would say, you know, uh, religious liberty for me, but not for thee, you know, yes. my right. uh, preferential treatment of right. certain, and that's, you know, quite obviously wrong, mm -hmm. and I think under the First Amendment and, and for other reasons. I think, you know, the other debates, not all of them, but some of them that you're alluding to, I think are, are can be tougher because, you know, you're trying to mark out where does the right to free exercise end, um, and where do other rights begin, how to, you know, in what situations and on, on a continuum, um, and it may be, you know, the difference between being in a church setting versus being in a commercial setting or a tax-funded setting, um, when you have competing human rights claims, religious exercise against, um, you know, LGBT equality or mm -hmm. reproductive rights, right. which right is going to prevail? Yes. And right. so I think it's, but I think it is helpful if you start to think about it on a spectrum and yes. there are going to be places where that calculus is going to be different depending on the setting. Right. Sometimes I, I, I worry that these issues are um, more easily discussed by the professionals than by uh, lay people and yet uh, it's so important for us somehow to make uh, this uh, history of legal interpretation and the First Amendment uh, live in our communities and in our homes and in our neighborhoods. Uh, and and, and we, we all of us have a duty to uh, engage in this thinking so that we can flourish in our neighborhoods and our neighbors can flourish as well. Right? That's a great point and you're so good at this um, and this is where 
you know, pastors and lay leaders just play such a huge role in um, helping people, you know, start conversations that are civil right. and productive and do involve people of different perspectives yes. trying to understand one another. So, you know, that bridging role that right. you play um, in terms of you're engaged in public policy, but you're, you're also a pastor and you're right. engaged with people that don't have any real, you know, or maybe not any interest, but they right. think they're not interested or they're not dealing with public policy. They're very busy in their daily lives and it seems far away from them, right. but yet they have these tensions inside. So it's so important, the leaders that we have who are being those bridge builders in communities and helping to bring people into conversation where it can be a, a productive conversation across different perspectives. Well, let's continue the conversation in just a moment. We're going to take a break, but I know you're writing a book about American religious life, and I want to hear more about that, and we'll talk about that Great. when we get back. Thanks. Thank Good God salutes the vital services provided to our community by the North Texas Food Bank. Each day, the North Texas Food Bank Feeding Network provides access to more than 190,000 meals for hungry children, seniors, and families. Visit ntfb.org to get involved. We're back with Melissa Rogers, and Melissa, uh, I understand you're in the process of writing a book, or maybe you finished it and you're getting ready to publish it. Tell us about what you're doing. I wish I were already finished it, but I'm not. Um, actually, I'm enjoying writing it. It's a book uh, on religion and American public life. I'm working with Baylor University Press. It'll be out sometime next year. Okay. And um, you know, one of the things that I'm talking about in this book is uh, that religion does play a role, a very robust role, and always has in American public life. Mm -hmm. And the Constitution supports that role through yes the free speech clause, the free exercise, and the establishment clause. Right. So I talk about, um, one of the things um, that I look at in the book is looking how, at how the establishment clause ensures that um, religion can actually be, have a, the opportunity to, be, to have that prophetic role, as Martin Luther King said, right. that the faith is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. Mm -hmm. And by ensuring that the government cannot back religion and interfere with religion, right. then that means that religion at its best can seek to serve as the conscience of the state and has done so at you know various pivotal moments in our nation's history. So that's one of the things that I look at and try to uh, demonstrate uh, through looking at Supreme Court case law and other ways that you know there's so many ways in which religion can play this vital role in our nation's public life. But doesn't it sometimes feel to you like we're having uh, a, a 200 year plus argument about this <laughs> in our country. I mean, it, it, it feels to me when I hear politicians who uh, continually say, yes, I know what the law says, but we really are a Christian nation, or I know what the law says, but uh, we, we're, going to, we're going to just say what we believe and mm -hmm. that sort of thing, and, and just sort of playing to that mindset uh, there, there are people who feel somehow that religion has been uh, unfairly mm -hmm. uh, quieted by right. um, uh, the by, by public officials or by the laws, and uh, deprive them of their right of free speech in, right. in that sense. And then on the other side, you hear people saying, "We really need to get re religion out of it altogether. That right. if, if we would simply be a more secular society, then these tensions that are driven by right. radical uh, religionists would would." We, we, we'd have peace in the public square. Right. Seems to me that both of those things are uh, extremes. And, yes. And yet, I wonder, Melissa, and here's the, really the heart of the question, too. You talked about King's perspective and all of that. How do we bring the particularism of all of our religions into conversation in the public square without then becoming simply civil religionists, you know, mm -hmm. that, that have a kind of watered down generalist view of, of religious life. Uh, Eisenhower famously talked right. about how I don't really care, you know, what your religion is, just, you know, if, if it's right. religion, it's good kind of thing. And right. uh, so, how do we have that particularity without, um, you know, watering down faith at the same well, time? And I think it's a great question. The, I'll give one example. There, 
there are two ways for uh, religion to, for example, have a role on government property or in government, uh, a government-sponsored co context, let's say, just to say government property. Um, you could try to get the government to put up a Ten Commandments monument, right. or you could try to get the government to um, embrace some other religious teaching uh, and put the government stamp of approval on it. Mm -hmm. And in that kind of context, not only are you, I think, violating everybody's conscience because we all don't agree about religion, but you are going to have religion controlled by government. Government right. is going to censor mm -hmm. what is said. Mm -hmm. It's not going to ever be able to stomach, a, you know, a prophetic religious message. Right. So it's going to tone it down and pick and choose the elements of faith that it likes, tone down the, the elements it doesn't like, right. and then we'll have, you know, a funhouse mirror version of right. our faith, and then we'll have to compete. Mm -hmm. against the government's big megaphone, and right. that will be very difficult. Then there's another way for religion to be involved in public life. There's public property all across the United States, um, include not just public parks, but including the use of government buildings, um, public schools after mm -hmm. hours, for example. Religious people can go and use those public parks for protests, and they can mm -hmm. say whatever they want. Mm -hmm. they bring their signs, have their marches, mm -hmm. have their speeches, um, use uh, on an equal, equal access, access basis right. government property, right. um, just as other community groups do. Mm -hmm. That is the better way to have religion right. in American public life. Then yes. we can bring our authentic messages into the public space, hopefully in a constructive, you know, way that's right. honoring of the First Amendment as well as our own beliefs. But it is not uh, governed or managed or watered down by government. Right. So I think we just, I, and my hope is that a lot of people who think that the only way to have religion in public life is to get the government to put up a Ten Commandments monument, have right. really just never had anybody talk to them about all these other opportunities. Right. And my hope is that when they do hear about it, they'll say, that sounds like a better solution. And yet there also has to be a kind of recognition of fair play, I think, with, when you think about even the equal access right. issue. Um, being a New Yorker, I follow some things still in New York, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we, we, I know that there was, a, there was a public school, for instance, that a religious community was meeting in right. for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. and, and as <coughs> such, you know, they, using equal access, they took it as a, a, a certain sense of privilege that they could do mm -hmm. so, but they were they were getting use of that facility, uh, in without a time restraint. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't temporary; mm -hmm. it was ongoing. And then you don't really have that space available for others at the same time. Right. And, and that's really an abuse of the equal access, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it has. They have to be. Um non-content related rules that right. apply to everyone equally. Right. So whatever the rules are, mm -hmm. you know, religion can't be preferred or some religions preferred. Right. Uh, so that's uh, unquestionably true. Um, at the same time, though, you know, I do understand like in, in New York, um, I think there was, I don't know if it's it maybe another case where one school was arguing that we just can't have a house of worship using our facilities right. because it'll appear that we're endorsing and of course this was after hours on the weekend sure. and that to me is just doesn't make sense uh, right. the Supreme Court has already said that I believe in, in an earlier opinion and um, interestingly uh, Thomas Jefferson I was been doing some research on the presidents in faith uh, not only attended some worship services that were held in the space where the House of Representatives was meeting mm -hmm. during the week, but it made it, uh, as so it's reportedly said, that he was helping other religious groups to use other federal property on the weekend for their worship services. And it's, uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, is the uh, um, statute of religious freedom and defender of the wall of separation. Right. So uh, I think those... In fact, he coined the phrase, he did. the wall of separation. He, he did. To uh, the Baptist. Uh, yes. yes. And uh, picking up on, I think, some ideas of Roger Williams as right. well. So yes, uh, the Dan letter to the Danbury Baptist. So these things are complex. And sure. I think sometimes we find um, government officials uh, taking a wooden approach. Okay. And they 
think about separation as meaning no contact. That's right. And in my view, separation actually means how do you ensure that institutions of government and religion are meaningfully independent of each other. Okay. Not segregation right. of church and state, mm -hmm. but separation in terms of retaining their independence from one another so that they can choose to cooperate in certain ways, but mm -hmm. they cannot order each other around, you know, right. um, a cert right. and um, I know that's a complex idea, but let's maintain a meaningful independence for church and state from one another. I often think of the poem by Robert Frost called Mending Wall <laughs> uh, as, as being uh, part of uh, the way I think about this. And, you know, most, most of us who read that poem uh, like to quote the part where he says, something there is that doesn't love a wall that wants it down, mm -hmm. you know. And yet, throughout the poem, it's much more ambiguous than that because every spring he and his neighbor would meet at the wall and rebuild it together. And they actually came to know each other better by the project of rebuilding the wall every mm. year. And so the, the question about do good fences make good neighbors mm -hmm. was really not uh, easily answered by the poem. It was, it, was, it was calling us to think about it, mm -hmm. to work hard. When I think about the wall of separation uh, between church and state, I think about how important it is for us to keep meeting at that wall, mm -hmm. you know. How, how if, if, if we have no wall, uh, then, you know, we're, we're in trouble. If, if the wall is uh, uh, impermeable or if there's no way to have converse back and forth, uh, then, then we're also in trouble. There has to be some sort of way in which we're constantly meeting right. there and having those conversations together. Yeah, I, and I think it's really important any time we're having a conversation about church-state separation or the wall of church-state separation, we have to say first, what do you mean by that? Right, right. Very Otherwise, good. we're taught we're often just talking past each other entirely. Right. Um, so I always say to people, you know, let's let's define our terms first, right. and then let's uh, then let's have a conversation. Because sometimes you can find that those terminologies and catchphrases that we've used um, can obscure as much as they enlighten. Right. Right. So if you were to look out on the religious landscape in America today, in the last few minutes we have, I, I, I'd be interested to know what do you think are you know, one or two of the most important things that we're wrestling with today that, uh, that you would like to point out and, and give us some guidance about? Well, I think um, first and foremost, in our own country, we need to make sure that we're actually defending and extending equal rights to religious freedom. Okay. No one has a special right to religious freedom. We all have equal rights. Right. And I become quite concerned when I hear uh, fellow Christians in particular talk about religious liberty in a way that doesn't seem to extend to non-Christians. Yes. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and really it's on us as Christians and Americans to stand up for the rights of people who are being excluded right now. And the painful reality is, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who, whether they're Jewish or Muslim or sick, they're fearful mm -hmm. to wear religious garb in public in the United right. States of America right now. Right. That's unacceptable. Right. They're fearful for their children yes. going to school. Right. Um, we see, you know, the rise in hate crimes and, mm -hmm. and threats and just, um, you know, a kind of ugliness that's yes. asserted itself. And, uh, you know, this nation has never um, aspired to unite us all on theological grounds, but right. rather around the Constitution and mm -hmm. its guarantees, um, and around, you know, a kind of, I think, a ca compassion and justice and liberty for all. So that's on my heart, Good. M you know, first and foremost right. for us to do right now. And I just would urge Christians in particular mm -hmm. to take this burden on and to think about for example, Christians in um, Muslim-majority countries. Yes. What would we want, you know, first of all, how could we be, how could we show the love of God as loving our neighbor, first and foremost, and then what would we want our Muslim neighbor in a Muslim-majority country to do for us to protect our free exercise rights? Well, then we, we better well be doing that here for religious minorities in the United States of America, and in fact, that's not only the right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do. Yes. Because I saw our leaders in government when we went to other countries where, you know, people were, the 
the tables were turned and there were different religious minorities there to say, we are in the United States of America protecting religious minorities vigorously. Right. And we urge you to do the same right. in your country. Um, and, that's and we have moral authority exactly. when we go to the world if we're doing it in our own country. Exactly. Well, it really does all boil down, I guess, when you come to the end of it, as this good God program suggests, mm -hmm. in the golden rule, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. I mean, if we really do unto others as we would have them do un unto us, Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's about that. Melissa, thank you for all your great work that you do, uh, not only defending religious liberty, but uh, also calling all of us to do the same alongside our neighbors. Uh, it it you, really George. makes for a better society. Well, I'm so grateful for all the work that you have done and all that you will do in the future as well. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Good God salutes the vital services provided to our community by the North Texas Food Bank. Each day, the North Texas Food Bank Feeding Network provides access to more than 190,000 meals for hungry children, seniors, and families. Visit ntfb.org to get involved.